So we are here at the International Urban Transition Conference yes. in Shanghai. Herbert Girardet, welcome to this interview. Thank you, Sarah. And you are an internationally recognized expert on future studies and also a member of the Club of Rome. That's true. And then you have also written many books, of which the most recent one is entitled uh, Regenerative Cities. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, could you first briefly define to me the concept of regenerative cities yes. and why this idea is needed? Well, uh, I have dealt with issues of sustainability for many years. And I find that the term is getting really worn and tired and misused in many different ways. And it's also a very passive term, you know. If I say to somebody, uh, I have a sustainable relationship to my wife, people will ask me, when are you going to have a divorce? So I think sustainability, you know, it started as a term used primarily as environmental sustainability then the social and economic sustainability was added and now that is becoming the predominant thing in, in defining sustainability and I think it's no longer good enough. And we haven't done very much sustaining for the last 20 odd years, 25 years, since the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 when this term was really put on the map for the first time. We have in fact run down the world's resources in, in terrifying ways since then, whether it is uh, deforestation and soil erosion, decarbonization of soils, the impacts on the oceans, but above all else, climate change. These are now very serious issues. So when we said we would sustain, we haven't done much sustaining. So I think the time has come to get, get serious about actually trying to regenerate degraded ecosystems. And that's certainly now a responsibility also for an urbanizing world. Cities are the dominant places in which humans live today. You know, we know the figures, 50% currently, but growing up to 60, 70% if current trends continue of humans living in cities. And so cities are using up the world's resources like never before in history. And unless cities develop a regenerative relationship between themselves and the natural world, humanity is in deep trouble. That's uh, indeed very uh, important because this criticism towards the concept of sustainable development uh, is based on its ambiguity. And also you add this, it's like a passive, in a sort of uh, sense, uh, this idea of regeneration, it's more active and yeah, dynamic yeah, and maybe yeah. positive even. So That's the idea, certainly. Yes. yes. And as you mentioned, uh, you see cities as systems, as complex Correct. ecosystems. It's very important. Yeah. And also well, in... Te yes. Technical and ecosystems. Yes, technical yeah. and ecosocial systems. Yeah, yeah, that's I right. Yeah. Add as well. Yeah. And also in the field of future research, the systems thinking is yeah. of course very much required and yeah. important. Yeah. But uh, what is your um, view? Why it is not so much adopted, this kind of system thinking, by urban governments? They uh, really have not been doing uh, or adopting this systems thinking yeah. uh, idea or approach. What could be done to conven convince urban policymakers to move towards this kind of approach, systems thinking? Yeah. Well, I mean, city planners, city authorities, city officials are focused primarily on running their cities and trying to do it in ways that satisfy the, the people living in those cities. But I sort of started to argue in that they live in a rather sort of pre-Galilean age. You know, Galileo was the first person to say the, the, the Earth is not the center of the, of the, of the, of the solar system, but the sun is the, the primary uh, source and the earth circulates around it. <coughs> cities are dependent systems and unless, unless city planners start thinking beyond the edge of the city, they are not going to get it right. But they don't have the power to do so half the time. That is the big problem. You know, if you, as a, as a city official these days, you're not primarily interested in where the food comes from, where the timber comes from, where the energy comes from. That's due to other people's, you know, companies more often than not. 
supermarkets for food, energy companies for, for the energy supplies and so on. So there's a sort of division between organizing the social life and the transport systems and so on within the cities and these broader issues. And so certainly uh, that needs to change and I think we need new national policies to enable cities to understand themselves, their systems and then to act responsibly vis-a-vis -vis their impacts on the environment. Definitely, and uh, it is of course difficult to try to see the whole picture, and also it is difficult to see long term, take the long yes, term. Yes, quite. And, Both and, and more, often, more often than not elected officials who want to be re-elected re -elected every four or five years uh, have short term perspectives defining their actions. Yes, and let's now move to the topic of energy. Right. Energy is of course a critical topic yes. for, for cities, for life for whole life yeah. and for sustainable cities or regenerative cities, yeah. as you say. So um, let me bring to your attention that in our research projects at Finland Futures Research Center, we are studying this kind of energy transition towards renewable energy-based yeah. society, yeah. even uh, promoting almost 100% renewable energy-based society. And this is uh, linked, of course, to the growing interest in the potential of solar energy and wind energy and also decentralization of the whole energy production system. Right. Yeah. Because now there is also a possibility to go to the scale of individual citizens and yeah. households. They could produce their own energy yeah. through solar and wind energy. So in your view, what is the best leverage bo point for getting this kind of renewable energy transition yeah. happen or start at least? Right. Yeah, so certainly the modern city is above, above, above what else a construct of fossil fuel energy. So I call that Petropolis, you know, the modern city. The individual consumer in, in, the, in the northern countries these days uses about uh, 6,000 watts of, of, of energy. But our physical capacity to produce energy from eating food and from our muscles is only about 100 watts maximum, you know. So we have massive additional energy input from fossil fuels and so the critical issue is of course of, first of all to find ways of reducing that amount which you know is very wasteful indeed and doesn't have to be at this level i mean even back in the 60s when we had a pretty comfortable lifestyle typically in europe we only used about a third of that amount of, so there is this kind of convergence needed between obviously new measures towards energy efficiency in our buildings and our transport systems and our food systems uh, which obviously itself requires significant policy initiatives. But secondly then, yes, can we turn Petropolis into a city that runs on, on renewables? And that's a big challenge. But when, you when it comes to the transformations that are already underway, particularly in Scandinavia, it's been remarkable how Denmark has started to initiate uh, wind power as a primary energy source, Norway with hydropower, I mean, Norway runs almost 100% in, in terms of its electricity system on hydro. I'm not sure to, to what extent hydro is a factor in, 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 in Finland. Or we not. have a lot of that, but uh, we have also started to, at the citizen level, there is increasing demand for uh, taking into use solar energy. Sure. And now there is the first example of a block of flats in Helsinki City. Right. So the block of yeah. flats has solar panels yeah. because individual houses already many many of them have yeah, so yeah. so the citizens would like to uh, sort of adopt lifestyles where they could uh, also include energy issues yeah, energy sure. is no more something in the background yeah, but yeah. it's something uh, part of our yeah. daily life so so i was also under uh, wondering uh, to conclude have you noticed or identified any weak signal in cities that you have studied or in cities that you have visited uh, some weak signal or an indicator of a new emerging issue or phenomenon whether it is related to uh, green lifestyles or not but any any new ideas because cities of course are a, a very old concept cities are evolving but also in, within the cities 
when societies evolve, new things are emerging. Sure. In the future, we will be very much interested in um, these monitoring these kind of new yeah. things. So. Well, I mean, one linking to the energy question, I mean, people are encouraged these days in, in various countries, in, in Scandinavia, also in Germany, no longer to just be consumers, to, but be prosumers, finding ways to produce rather than simply take resources uh, from nature. And uh, certainly solar energy is an important one. And that is changing also the lifestyles within cities without a question. So certainly with the right policy signals, you know, feed in tariffs, throw renewable energy, this transformation is beginning to be achieved. And moving away from the reliance of the private motor car is a strong trend that we can observe now in cities, particularly younger people. Of course, it's linked to the sort of selfie culture. You know, you, yes. <laughs> you, you are no longer primarily concerned with, you know, getting around physically, but you can move physically by looking at, at, a scre at, at, at some sort of screen. Cases. Certainly, urban agriculture is becoming a big issue now again. I mean, in, in the past, cities had lots of farmland within them that enabled people to grow some crops. That is coming back in a significant way. Uh, urban agriculture, also vertical cultivation, is becoming a big issue now. And it's with LED lights and so on, you can't have, it, have enclosed buildings that don't have sunlight like traditional greenhouses, but where you basically use LED light, hopefully produced from wind and solar, to, to produce vegetables on stacks. So that makes it possible for the city to be much rely, less reliant on large areas of farmland outside yes. and to be uh, reliant on, on, on local to production of some of the food. But when it comes to grain, of course, you still need very large surface areas or, or meat, you know, animal feeds and so on. But by and large, you know, I find that this concern about the future uh, of humanity and its impact on the environment is leading to a new kind of tendency for people to be responsible consumers, prosumers, uh, you know, uh, uh, scrutinizing the products that they buy, much more, you know, uh, fair trade being another major factor in all this. So this range of issues concerned with personal health, uh, family health, less uh, exposure to air pollution, uh, less uh, impact on ecosystems as people watch television. All of these are beginning to emerge as significant factors in the way we organize our urban lives. Yes, definitely. And uh, this gives uh, a huge potential for optimism, these kind yeah, of new things yeah. and vertical farming, etc. To conclude, can you give an example of your favorite example of a livable and regenerative city, a few? cities around yeah. the world, which yeah. are your favorite cities in this yeah. respect, both livable yeah. and yeah. regenerative. Well, I mean, I've had an opportunity to, to work in, in Adelaide, Australia, uh, 13 years ago, where I was asked to be a thinker in residence. It was a very int interesting situation. It's, it's a city of about 1.3 million people at the end of a very small river, and that river was beginning to dry up about 15 years ago coming all the way from, from uh, South Australia through to, to, uh, to uh, Southeast Australia to South Australia. So they've been beginning to think, you know, can this city exist in the future if we don't have water? And then they thought, well, should we really think about the whole urban system? And so the government of South Australia called in people like myself to kind of come up with ideas for how to reconfigure the way that city works. And so in my case, I started making a plan over a 10-week ten period for you know, speeding up renewable energy, massive steps towards recycling, including uh, organic waste recycling, urban French farming being reintroduced, uh, new transport systems, uh, particularly much more reliance on both the uh, on cycling and, the, and, the, and, and public trams and so on. Cut a long story short, the transformation has been astonishing. And it's now listed as one of the five most livable cities on the planet, and it's got the highest level of renewable energy anywhere in the world of 45% of solar and wind electricity. Uh, the transformation has had tremendous positive effects in people's pride, pride of that city, and it's re reflected now in both environmental sustainability really being a significant factor in the way the city works as well as livability.
Okay, so because I believe in the power of examples, so thank yeah. you for this information. I will immediately look into it. So thank you for so, asking me for this interview. Yes, thank you very much, Herbert. Okay, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you.